Europeans, more than 3,000 years ago, were the ones who came up with this incredible investigation into the nature of self. And this is the, this is the, this is, this is the context in which Buddha came out, you know, out of. Then, of course, he diverged in his own direction, specifically in relation to his own direct findings about the nature of self. But I think it's interesting in our culture, we go, we go back, we, go, we know about the Greeks and the Romans, we think they're great, but we never think of the Indians. I mean, these, these Indians are absolutely unbelievable. And then we think it was Mr. Freud, maybe 100 years ago, who came up with all the ideas about the mind. I mean, excuse me, how embarrassing. <laughs> these unbelievable Indians, more than 3,000 years ago, you know. And they're the ones who created this technique that's called, as we know these days, mindfulness meditation, which is, it's, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a cobbling together of various views that come from Buddha, which came from these Hindus, using this incredible psychological skill that's, you know, that enables us to get our mind to a much subtler level, to access the subtler levels of our own mind that we don't even posit as existing in the West. It's beyond the brain, beyond the conceptual, beyond the sensory. They're the ones who got, that, got to this one. And they, on the basis of this astonishing clarity, they were able to literally map the mind, you know, internally, not the brain, not with microscopes, with their own mind. But this is utterly invisible to the West. And of course, even the most Buddhists, you know, don't kind of tweak it. The best, most Buddhists can think is you've got to be mindful. I mean, it's like so embarrassing, you know, it's so superficial. Our knowledge of really where Lord Buddha comes from and, and, and the source of it is extraordinary Indians, you know. So the, the text, this map of the mind that these Hindus came up with from their own internal process is still the basis of the, of, of, of the models of the mind that are taught in the Tibetan Buddhist monastic university system today. So it's pretty remarkable, you know. So Buddha, of course, refined his own views. That's the first thing to think about, the, the amazing history of these teachings that we're going to discuss. But the other thing is really, really, really crucial to remember. You know, because we think of this as religion, you know, I'm a nun, I sang a prayer, this is more holy, with more holy pictures than most Catholic churches, I tell you, these days, I mean, I'm, the number of prayers I do these days is my Catholic upbringing for dead. <laughs> you understand, really, it's religion. So as soon as we go religion, we kind of get all lighty down and lose our common sense. And this is, that's really quite, it's utterly necessary to remember, again, who Buddha is in, the, in relation to all this stuff. And the crucial point is, the crucial point is, Buddha is not a creator and doesn't assert one. That's a shock, because as soon as we hear it's religious information, we assume it's information from on high that we're all supposed to believe. Why? Because God created it. And I'm being sarcastic here. I don't know what being a Christian. I think it's amazing. But this is not the approach in Buddhism. Not the approach at all. Utterly, profoundly, and completely different. Buddha was a regular guy who, from his own hard work, became what is labelled a Buddha. And then the, Tibetan etymo the, the, the etymology of the Tibetan word for Buddha, which is Sanskrit, Sangye, is really tasty. It tells us exactly this. You know. The first syllable, Sang, implies the utter eradication from our being, our mind, our consciousness. These words are used synonymously, our consciousness, our mind. The utter eradication of every atom of ego and negativity and neurosis and fears and drama and depression and anxiety and jealousy and low self-esteem and all the other rubbish that we, in our models of the mind, in the midst of the materialist world, totally take as real and normal. In fact, we think they're so normal, you'd be considered abnormal if you didn't have them. But this is Buddha's point. We can rid the mind of them. They're adventitious, they say. Get your dictionary out. That means they're not at the core of our being. This is shocking to consider if we compare with the materialist psychology. And because we don't hear words like this, we, as soon as we hear it, yeah, achieve nirvana, wow, far out, wonderful liberation from suffering and its causes, we just don't get the point. We can't join the dots here. We don't hear it really simply. That it's the Buddha's own direct experiential findings from the depth of his own mind about how things are, you know. So this first one is, we can read the mind of all the rubbish. The second one, the second syllable, ge, implies the development, literally, to perfection, of all the goodness within us, <clears throat> all the wisdom, love, compassion, joy, all the good stuff, to perfection. My Catholic mother was shocked. You know, only God is perfect. No, no, Buddha says we can all become us. We can all become perfect. This is what Buddha has found to be so. The words are so simple. And as he, what is he talking about? Not some secret part of us, but our mind. So given that our mind can become a Buddha, our mind can be rid of the rubbish and full of the goodness to perfection, and they're just the simple words for it, we better know what he means by the mind, because it's radically different from what we think, that's for sure, in many ways, you know. So this is the nuts, this is the basis. The, the, having this in our mind, at least theoretically, is in the basis of beginning to comprehend what Buddha's on about, you know. 
And it's not a belief system. It's just not, it's not a question of believing. Belief is a state of mind and it's a necessary one in the progress, in the process, you know, and they talk about it in Buddhist psychology, but it's based on certain things. But it's not the way we tend to think of a spiritual path. Utterly, completely different. So first of all, the mind for the Buddha, the words used virtually synonymously with the word consciousness. That's the first one. Second, and already this is shocking, it's not physical. It's not one atom of your mind that is physical. The Buddha does not argue that we have a brain. He agrees we've got a brain. He will probably appreciate all the, the neuroscientists. But not one atom of our mind is our brain. You are some amazing Tibetan meditator who's been off in the mountains the last 60 years has never met a Western scientist. Where his brain is, he wouldn't have a clue. He's never heard of it. But he surely knows his mind. The third point about the mind, as far as Buddha's own experiential findings are concerned, is that it, this is another shock too. It is not the handiwork of someone else. It is not given to us by somebody. This is like incredible. If we're Christians, God gave us a soul. If we're materialists, mummy and daddy created us, essentially, isn't it? But these are not the Buddha's views, completely different. His, his own experiential findings says no, he disagrees with that. So the next point about the mind, which is his findings, is that if it's not the source, if you don't find yourself in the source and you're back in your parents and the grandparents and grandma and grandpa and back to the monkeys, then where's, what's the source of who you are? Where's it come, where do you come from? Where do I, where do I begin, as we say? Or what is, what is my source? If I'm not a product of my mummy and daddy's, you know, my body is, no problem. They work really hard to get that egg and sperm together. That is no doubt. Eyes can see that. Egg and sperm is the, is the source of my body, but not my mind. And so, you know, this is the next point about the mind. First of all, before we go to where it comes from, what, what, is, what do these words refer to? Well, the thoughts, intellect, feelings, emotions, subconscious, unconscious, up instinct, intuition. You know, all these words, the entire spectrum of our inner being, from the grossest to the most subtle level, necessarily for the Buddha, this is what is referred to by mind or consciousness. So this implies already, indicating well, from what we said about the Hindus, that mind goes to far more subtle levels than we would ever even think of existing in the, in the material as well. You know, the, 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 fun, the part of our mind that functions indeed through the medium of the brain, the nervous system and the body, is the grossest of the grossest tip of the iceberg of our mind for the Buddha. So therefore, so the next point, the, you know, the next point, where does our mind come from then? When did I begin, as we say? Well, if we think of our mind as a river of mental moments, and in Tibetan like Buddhist psychology, they use the term mental continuum. Mental continuum. If we think of our consciousness like that, like a river of mental moments, and if we had perfect memory, we know perfectly well that if we think of this moment of mind, what was its source, the immediate previous moment? And what was the source of that immediate previous moment necessarily was the very previous moment. It's like chains, links in a chain, you know? And if you had perfect memory, you'd go back and you'd track each of these moments of mind in an unbroken chain of mental moments and you'd end up, wouldn't you? You'd get back, keep going back, keep going back, in the womb, one month, six, you know, nine months, eight months, seven months, where did that moment of consciousness come from? It has to come from a previous moment of consciousness. Where did that one come from? It has to come from a previous moment of consciousness. You get back to the first second of conception in your mummy's womb. Well, what about the previous moment? Well, the egg was in mummy's body, sperm was in daddy's, we know that. But the, the, the continuity, your consciousness, the previous, the previous moment of your consciousness is the source of that moment. And that, where did it come from? The previous. And before you get very far back, a few weeks before that, you'll find that that consciousness, Buddha would say, was in a previous body. And you keep going back. And you keep going back. And you keep going back. This is Buddha's observation. This is his findings. It's not information coming from on high. And therefore it's necessarily something that anybody else, a regular human like he was, could prove from their own experience if you follow Lord Buddha's methodology. This is, this is the implication of this, you know. And indeed our consciousness will continue and necessarily from the, the last second of this life it will continue on in its own river of mental moments, going on and on and on. This is a fundamental point to take on board as our hypothesis if we want to listen to and think about, the, you know, coherently, even intellectually understand Buddha's views. This is a fundamental basis. And of course, taking it as a hypothesis is the perfect way to say it. I never say, I believe in this. This intellectual laziness, you know. It's too cheap and easy just to believe in something because it sounds cute, you know. Or you disbelieve equally. It's just completely ridiculous. So it's our hypothesis. 
our working hypothesis. It's mine anyway. So the final point about the mind, which I already indicated, is its, is its potential, which is the point of all of this stuff. Potential for perfection, what it says, to rid the mind of all the rubbish and grow all the goodness, that's it, you know. And what, what's the point of that? Is because then you'd be this infinitely wise being beyond the sense of a separate, miserable, little, poor, self-pitying me, which is what Lama Yeshi called the ego. You'd have infinite compassion, infinite empathy, infinite wisdom, infinite vast, you know, expansive consciousness, effortlessly capable of doing whatever needs to be done to benefit sentient beings. This is the Buddha. And the Mahayana view of Buddhism says this is the potential of every being. So this is, the, this is what this stuff's about. This is presenting Buddha's findings. And then Buddha's findings, his views about how things are, are the views of the person who's taking all this stuff as their hypothesis, as, you know, taking it on board and attempting to bring one's own mind into sync with this, you know, each step of the way. Like you, in other words, it's a learning process. It's a learning process. Listening, thinking about it, analysing it. And each step of the way, ticking the boxes like you would learning anything. You get to grade one music, the person told you it was like this, you just passed music grade one, you tick the box and you made the experience your own. You verified it and you made it your own experience. You go to the next step, the next grade, next grade, and you keep on moving like that, just like you learn anything. Same here. So you're internalising it as you go along. And each step of the way, you check, you know, you tick that box, now I've experienced that, now I've verified that. You go to the grade two, grade three, and so on. And as the Dalai Lama says, if you get to a certain point, having got moved forward using Buddha's methodology, if you get to a point where you actually prove that Buddha's wrong, then you must reject him. You know? This is the approach. This is the best approach. So it's hands-on, full engagement. That's what being a Buddhist means. And we can go at our own pace. That's okay, you know. We have to go at our own pace. There's no other pace. That's it, you know. Take 20 million lives to get in life. You okay, you'll take one life. It's up to you. You can be like Federer, or you can practice tennis once a month. It's up to you, you know, how much you engage. The more you engage, the more likely you get the results. But that's up to us, what we came for. Of. Okay, so given that this mind is a continuity, it goes back and back and back, and given it's got this marvellous potential, and then given that life is short, we can see that, you know, blink of an eye before you know it, you're dead. Then we've, got to, then we've got to, you know, get passed through this very inconvenient thing called death. It's a big drag, actually. Drop this boring old bag of bones and get another one. But it's a difficult thing to do, to navigate. So we need to learn to live, know how to live our lives so we can die a decent death, so we can carry on bopping on in our spiritual path, at the very least, another, one, another life like this one. But it's up to us to do the work. This is why death's important for a Buddhist student. The world now is wonderful, having so much more talk about death. You know, in the West. But from the Western materialist point of view, death's important only insofar as the people living can come to terms with it. Once, you're, once your loved one's dead, it's all about you now, and the grieving and all the rest. The dead person, they're gone, as far as we're concerned. Well, from the Buddhist perspective, the person, you know, it's the dead person that we're caring about. <clears throat> so this book of Bhagavad Zopra Rimaches that we're using as some of our teachings, you know, the discussion we're going to have here when death topic comes up. As he makes out, and he makes the point he makes, you know. The, the reason, if you're going to help anybody in their life, the best time to help them is when, at the time they're going to die, at their death, before and at the time of death. Why? As he says, is because that is when, precisely, that is when the, the karmic seed that, is, that will be triggered, that will be the cause of the next rebirth for that person. He says, I can't stress enough the important role of the person helping someone at the time of death. So to understand this, we have to understand Buddha's view about the mind, and we have to understand Buddha's view about karma. These are like the, the fundamentals of Buddha's entire worldview. And Buddhism indeed is a worldview. This might be evident to many people, you know, because many people in the world, and that's okay, it's up to us, you know, like Buddhism, and think mostly many people think about being mindful, meditating. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong. Because that's like, you know, a tenth of, you know, some millionth of a percent of Buddhism. Buddhism is a worldview. And that's what's studied in the Tibetan monastic university system, which is the, the system that our Marvelous Lama has got educated in. His Holiness Lama's open on the Yeshi, etc., etc., etc. It's an entire view of the universe. And that's up to each individual. Not everybody wants a big worldview. It's okay. I just happen to know that as a kid, that really always interested me, you know. So that's, we're going to be talking about Buddha's worldview. And the way to listen to this, like I said, is listen to it as to get tools from it. Much of it you might not want to use. It's okay, you're the boss, not Buddha. So it's up to you to decide you know, what you take from it. So 
So I read Buddha, the regular guy who became a Buddha. So no matter how clever the information is, if somebody called Einstein writes a book, we first have to establish that he knows what he's talking about. And then we have to assume, don't we, that if we do know he's valid, we have to assume, this is a really good point, we have to assume that whatever he writes in that book is coming from his own experience. We have to know that. It's either he's taken it from someone else and stolen it, which means he's a fraud, or he will tell you, this is what I have learned from my teacher, I haven't realised it yet, but this is what I've learned from my teacher, so he's being honest then. Or he's lying and makes it all up. There's only three options, really. So you better, you know, we, we take this as a given. Even a cookbook, you check. Even a cookbook, you have to recognise the person's valid. They're either telling you someone else's experience and they happily, you know, quote their mother, whose recipes you want to give, or they say, these are the recipes that I know that I have done from my own experience. Or they're lying. You've got to decide which one it is, you know, so Buddha's the same. But the trouble is when it comes to spiritual, because we think, oh, I'm allowed to believe what I like, we all think it's a belief system. We think, therefore, it's not provable. Therefore, we can think anybody's allowed to say and think what they like. That's how we think in our materialist culture. It's beyond irresponsible, you know, beyond shocking. Even so much junk about Buddhism is published. I mean, as if I know anything, excuse me, but, you know, no sources, no valid sources. Some Westerners go off, do a course for a week, get a bit of a nice feeling and write a bloody book. It's really beyond shocking, actually. <laughs> so we really should check, you know. You should check this place. I mean, I was talking to you people enough, I know this place. I don't know if you knew or not. Maybe, the, you know, complete fraud of this place. You should check out. Valid source. They're not inviting peanuts to come and give talks, you know. <laughs> Isn't it? You should. <laughs> That's how to us. And then, if it is that Cook or that Einstein, we know if it's coming from their own experience and they're regular humans like you and me, then hey, guess what? I can do it too. That's the way to think about this. Because we're so fixated on the view of the materialist one that if you can't see it, you can't prove it, that as soon as we hear that Buddha says reincarnation, then we assume you can't prove it. Then we think it's belief. But our assumptions are wrong, because we have, the, we have another view of the mind. We're so stuck in our materialist views as being the universe, you know? So we've got to open our minds to the possibility and look at our assumptions. That's what we must do to listen to Buddhism properly. Okay, so... Well, let's look at what the mind is then. Just look at what the mind is. There's many ways of talking about it. But let's look at it in a simple way, in a one way. So one of the, so we've got different one way that we can describe the mind is it's got two ways of two ways of knowing. One way is sensory consciousness, and one way is mental consciousness. Let me point here. Sensory consciousness and mental consciousness. Well the mental consciousness as long as I Ricochet puts it, that's where the workshop is. That's where all our memories are stored. That's where all the millions of thoughts and feelings and emotions and unconscious and subconscious. And they're all, all the, you could say, all the contents of our mental consciousness. And this is a crucial way to understand from Buddhist perspective. Everything in our mental consciousness is a viewpoint. It's a way of saying it. We'll, we'll go into this. You'll see our point. So let's say, you know, so what's the senses then? What do the senses do? Well, you know, from the Buddha, the senses are like dumb animals. They're profoundly limited in their cap capacity for cognition. But we make the body the boss. As Rami Yeshi says, you know, totally misleading, totally we led up a garden path by absurd senses. And it's serious, this. So to really understand Buddha's take on it is extremely helpful. You know, my example, I might go, wow, what a pretty cup. And I might go like that. I might very well go like that. What a pretty cup, I'd say, you know. Except the top doesn't belong. They didn't need the top part, that was overdoing it. But the rest of it's quite pretty, but this part of the top's unnecessary. Sorry, it's my professional <laughs> comment. My personal comment. I'm joking. Okay, just how I say it's a pretty cup. So you naturally deduce, don't you? When the eye consciousness goes here, looks at this, and in a millisecond, I will say, oh, what a pretty cup. So we can all assume, and we do assume this, don't we, that my eye consciousness, my eyes, of seeing a pretty cup. Ridiculous, Buddha says. It's not possible. They're not capable. Eye consciousness is capable only of cognizing two things, shape and colour. Doesn't even know the words, just shape and colour. So you've got and then ear consciousness, what does that cognize? I might hear one note of that trumpet and I'll go, wow, Miles Davis. So we assume my ear consciousness, my ears are hearing sound. My ears are hearing Miles Davis. Not true. 